This podcast is brought to you by Pragmatic Solutions, the leading iGaming PAM platform with a modular approach, including many benefits like a fast, secure, and scalable API-based platform integrated with all major third-party products and services. Make sure you head over to Pragmatic Solutions and join our smart thinking. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're listening to this uh, iGaming Next marketing podcast. Today, we have a lot of good stuff for you. We have Ulrich Gillo from Betson Group, who is the head of media. And we're going to be talking about media effectiveness in 2023. We're covering a lot of good stuff. How can you be more efficient in your media spend? What's going to happen or what's the current status on a cookie-less future? And we also touch on ChatGPT and what we think will happen in iGaming when ChatGPT comes in. So listen to this episode. Thank you very much. Ulrich, nice to have you here with us. Uh, this is the first time ever, actually, I'm recording from the actual uh, studio of iGaming Next. Normally it's been uh, Zoom and Google Meet and whatever you have uh, of uh, various communication tools over the past two years. But here we are physically sitting in front of each other. Fantastic. How Fantastic nice is that? Studio. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no worries at all. It's almost like a living room. I would probably live here, I think, if, uh, if like I... Like a living room or <laughs> an electronic music studio, as we, we, we spoke about just before this session. I, I like it very much. It's exactly an amazing investment and uh, impressive, I would say. Exactly. So uh, for, the, for the audience uh, back home, uh, please uh, be excused uh, up front here that uh, if Ulrich or myself drop a few uh, DJ uh, stories from the past, it's because we, we both uh, share a, a background as a DJ and also very much a big passion around music. So uh, we might drop Indeed. a few hints uh, along the way. But anyway, what we're here to talk about really is uh, media effectiveness in 2023. Uh, but before we do that, Ulrich, why don't you give uh, the audience uh, an introduction to who you are and, uh, and your career uh, journey up until now? Sure. Um, so I've worked in the marketing and advertising industry for about now 17 years. Yeah. Uh, I started it by accident with um, SEO back then in New York. Um, I had applied for a fellowship with the city of Brooklyn because mm -hmm. my dream was to be a, at first, a DJ, professional DJ and music producer. We spoke about this yes. a little bit before. Yes. But I wanted to keep a, a very creative career. And so my dream was to shift a little bit to the creative side, but more on the imagery. Mm -hmm. So um, I was awarded a fellowship from the city of Brooklyn to learn graphic design and web design back then with Dreamweaver and those uh, yeah. solutions that existed. Yes. And uh, from there, then uh, this gave me an opportunity to work for a small startup e-commerce platform selling counter surveillance, surveillance equipment and yeah. tracking equipment back then. Uh, they were using a small Yahoo uh, for small business solutions e-commerce platform mm -hmm. and I get my got my hands dirty and started working on the optimization of uh, the experience on on the website okay and very quickly very quickly then uh, I was introduced by the owner of this company to SEO mm -hmm. SEO what, mm. what is SEO mm. at the time not many people were using SEO so yeah. that uh, what year what year it is this was in 2005 2006 yeah. around so yeah. Yeah, about 17 yeah. 18 yeah. years it, time flies time flies um, and then um, the impact of the, the the optimization you could make just on the content not even talking about link building yeah. at the time yeah uh, was already great yes. so you could see the results of your SEO implementations within a few days. Yeah, those were the days. Those were the days. It was <laughs> very, a lot very has different. changed since Yes, that. yes, yeah. it was it was fantastic. Yeah, and then uh, from that, I was poached by a small advertising agency um, to specialize also in SEO. Mm -hmm. Then we joined a, a bigger group called Digitas, which is part of uh, the publicist group. Mm -hmm. Worked across multiple uh, verticals. Uh, but I already started working on, in um, regulated industries such as uh, pharmaceutical. Mm -hmm. So some of the clients I was working on were Bristol Myers Squibb, uh, AstraZeneca, mm -hmm. Pfizer, and, and so forth. Yeah. And that's where I really learned uh, my what I call and refer to uh, my MBA in digital advertising. Digital yeah. back then was a reference in, in all things related to 
media, yeah. advertising, creative, yeah. etc. Yeah. Stayed in New York for about 14 years. I didn't start, you know, my career in SEO. Mm -hmm. I started actually as a waiter okay. in, in New York City. How did you get to New York City in the first place? Like, what was your reason for Oof, it? comes back to music. The music. The okay. first time I went to New York was in 1996 in February. Yeah. Uh, February 1996, if you look it up in, on, on Google, was a very, very, very cold year. Okay. With a lot of snow. Yeah. Super cold. Uh, so it wasn't quite a great experience for me, first experience in New York in mm. winter, because, uh, yeah. you know, besides spending a lot of time in the record stores, yeah. that's pretty much all I did during that, that time, that, <laughs> that <heating>. holiday. <laughs> but exactly. And so I decided very quickly to <laughs> come back in summer mm. and i enjoyed the complete opposite yeah super hot and humid yeah yeah <laughs> and so but coming back to the career i, yeah. I started you know going there in 1996 yeah. my dream was to one day in my life yeah. i would live and work in new york yes my friend back then had a girlfriend who uh, was working in an advertising agency i didn't yeah. know anything about it before yeah. and it was called sachi and sachi yeah when they're small, small agency. Yes. <laughs> I, I didn't know that. No. I didn't know what it was. Yeah. So um, I went there and I was really impressed by the layout of the office yeah. and, and, and all these things. And really, literally, Michael, it's real what I'm saying. Yeah. I, and I say it with emotions. Yeah. I said, I'd love to work this in this, this space. Yeah. I, I, I'm studying marketing. Yeah. This is a marketing organization. I hope that one day I could even work in this space, but yeah. maybe in my dreams. Yeah. Well, forward this a little bit, you know, later. Yeah. Back in 2007, then mm -hmm. I ended up nailing a job as an SEO supervisor at Digitas, which okay. was a sister agency of yeah. Sachi Sachi. Yeah. Okay. And it happened sometimes that I ended up in some of those meeting rooms discussing strategy for yeah. the future. One of those pharmaceutical brands yeah. giving me chills and goosebumps yeah. because I realized that, wow, my goodness, yeah. I'm discussing with very smart people yeah. what it is that the strategy and the communication will be for yeah. one of these massive yeah. pharmaceutical company yeah. or brand. <laughs> And so from that on, then, you know, Digitas gave me the chance to touch upon PPC. Yeah. At the time when Google was really pushing and the emphasis on one plus one equal three, mm -hmm. that being that if you merge both PPC and SEO, yeah. you will automatically have an incremental number mm -hmm. of click-throughs. Mm -hmm. And so that probably was one of the strategies to push both. Yeah. But I embraced this opportunity to take both channels mm -hmm. under my remit and try to drive it uh, at, at Digitas in yeah. New York. Yeah. Then um, from there, I moved to another advertising agency called RGA, which is part of the uh, Interpublic Group. Mm -hmm. Then moved back to um, Europe, mostly spending a lot of time in London. Mm -hmm. And there, my remit started to change. Um, while the United States is very um, centered within itself, mm -hmm. thinking that the rest of the world looks the same as the way yeah. they look. Yeah. Uh, what I realized that even though we wanted to be global while operating from New York, mm. a more global setup mm -hmm. or a more global favorite setup mm -hmm. is London. Mm -hmm. So the role in London is not so much just limited yeah. to market specific, but mm -hmm. it's usually one of those global hubs yeah. where the operations, mm -hmm. the governance mm -hmm. and best practices are being discussed yeah. because ge geographically you're located in the center. Yeah. You can speak with New Yorkers yeah. during you know, the different time zones, yeah. but also you can speak to the yeah. MENA section of yeah, the world yeah, yeah. on the APAC part yeah. of the world yeah. while still having an opportunity to speak to both. Yeah, you get exposed to a lot of different markets in London, whereas yes. in New York, it's more uh, uh, US specific, I would imagine, in most cases. Yeah. US centric yeah, yeah, yeah. with an ambition to be global, but <laughs> yeah. really the global hubs most of the time are located in London for yeah. the reasons that I explained yeah. to you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so that's what I did. And in, 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 in London, really, you know, part of the work was not only to focus on the UK market, mm -hmm. 
but also work more on best practices that would be fed from the different suppliers, vendors, yeah. and media owners yeah. within London to, to drive you know, the vision mm -hmm. of media and marketing mm -hmm. worldwide, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then from London, how did you, how did you end up in Malta? <laughs> Oh, Malta. And iGaming as well. Malta, <laughs> exactly. So Malta was never on my map. Yeah. Uh, neither was London. Mm. Uh, but what happened is that personal reasons actually mm. pushed me here. Mm. Mm. I had, yeah, a difficult divorce. That's, mm. that's who I am. So mm. I'm, I'm, I'm fine, you know, sharing this. Yeah. And, uh, but I also missed quite a bit of sun. Yes. So the distinction that I always make when people ask me about, oh, would you prefer London or do you prefer yeah. New York? Yeah. I like them both. Yeah. But the biggest difference is that New York is more condensed, yeah. more compact yes. and high. Yeah. London is more spread out. Yeah. So you can feel a bit lonely and isolated in London, a yeah. bit more than in New York. Yeah. And the weather is different. Yes. Okay, you have the differences. Yeah. Hot weather in New York, yeah. in summer, very cold in winter. Mm -hmm. But there is one thing in New York that you don't have in the other part of the Northern Euro European continent yeah. is the sun. Yes. A lot of sun. Yeah. And so as my divorce came up, I thought that I needed to reach the sun. Get back to the and sun. And brighten yeah. my life. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, uh, and so I looked into opportunities in, in Malta. Yeah. And uh, well, iGaming is by definition the industry that dominates <laughs> this this country. And uh, yes. this is how I ended up working in iGaming. Okay, cool. Yeah. Fantastic. And today you're at Betson for, for the ones who, who might not know. Been there two and a half years. Yeah. Uh, very proud to be part of this uh, organization. Yeah. Uh, and I, I find uh, the organization to be very forward thinking. So yeah. it's, a, it's a great um, driver when it comes to all things related to innovation, yeah. uh, marketing, responsible uh, gaming, mm -hmm. etc. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. it's a good place to be in. Oh, very good. And your current role at Betson, uh, how would you do it? describe that one? Uh, what's your responsibility and, and what, do you do, what do you sit with day to day? So I sit within the marketing department as mm -hmm. a head of media. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of my role is very much uh, focusing on, on 360, marketing 360. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm uh, trying to drive innovation within the organization yeah. uh, for, from every channel possible, really. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but for some reason, my passion point within the media industry has shifted towards something that's called programmatic. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a fun channel to be in, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that I'm ignoring the, the others. Yeah. And so uh, with the help of our, our internal teams, but also agencies that we have partnered with, mm. I'm trying to move the agenda forward when it comes to finding new ways to uh, reach our audiences, mm -hmm. build the brand, mm -hmm. enhance the acquisition, mm -hmm. uh, and have a... An, an impact as a whole within the organization. Maybe also ad tech is one of those uh, yeah. passion points of mine. Yeah. So a little bit of everything, but yeah. looking at it from a 360 angle. Nice, fantastic. And uh, that I guess that brings us up to yeah the topic for today, media effectiveness in 2023. But before we, uh, we dig into this, um, you know, we spoke a little bit before we started recording here that there's as many definitions of uh, what is marketing, what is media and all these, uh, all this terminology that we use, uh, you know, if you ask 100 people, you'll probably get 100 different definitions. So uh, the good thing is we can define our own definitions, so, so to speak. So if we look at uh, definition of, uh, of marketing, it's just starting at the very basic. What, 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 would you, what would be your definition of marketing? Well, the definition of marketing is probably the one I, the one I would refer to is the one I learned from school. Yeah. And the reference that I, I got from school was Cutler. Yes. And Cutler uh, is really focusing on uh, meeting the needs mm -hmm. and desires of our consumers. Mm -hmm. And I think that my mission as a media owner within mm -hmm. the, the, Betson, uh, the Betson group mm -hmm. is to find ways to enhance the user experience, not so much to push a communication to them, but really yeah. to listen to what it is that the consumers want yeah. and find the best way possible to respond to their mm -hmm. needs mm -hmm. and desires, really. Yeah. yeah. 
Okay. In our instance, for 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 instance, well, in our case, for instance, yeah. I would say that the desire of those who want to engage with Betson is probably to make money. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they need maybe is to be entertained. Mm -hmm. And so, how do we make the experience so that both their needs and the desires yeah. are met? Yes. <laughs> exactly. Very very good. And we also speak about. Uh, you and I have had a lot of conversation around sort of, the, you know, the classic marketing theory is, uh, well, there's a lot of it evol evolving around the, the four Ps, uh, for example. And uh, yes. uh, and I know we, we've spoken about this. You definitely have a view on that. So how do you, do you feel we use the four Ps in iGaming marketing? And, uh, and if so, how? I think that the four Ps are used, but I think that there is a legacy in the iGaming industry mm. where some of the Ps are owned by specific stakeholders, mm. but sometimes not really managed under a unique umbrella. Yeah, they're distributed across different teams, uh, so to speak. Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, the, the way I look at it is, uh, well, in, as a media specialist, mm -hmm. I very much focus on the placement mm -hmm. of our brand mm -hmm. wherever it, it may be necessary yeah the positioning of our brands and the yeah. way we communicate and yeah. the way we're being perceived as a brand where mm -hmm. are we communicating mm -hmm. but i do not touch the price mm -hmm. the, the one of the other these other pieces so yeah. you know i'm referring to the promotion piece promotion is pushing yes the content that we have to our consumers yeah the placement is which device it goes on to, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. Pricing would be the welcome offers and what it is that makes us different. Yeah. And this is a different topic <laughs> in the industry. What makes us so different when actually we pretty much all have a similar product. Yeah. So we have product, price, promotion, yeah. place, position. Yeah. So, you know, these, yes. these P's are sometimes a little bit blurry as yeah. well. Yeah. But price is not so much one of those P's that I touch, yeah. that yeah. I decide upon. Yeah. Uh, and the product is not something that I touch either. I, yeah. I amplify the product. Yeah, exactly. And and price is such an interesting one, right? So if you sell a car, there's very clearly a price tag on that car. Uh, and there's most likely price elasticity and, and all these uh, sort of traditional uh, marketing functions in, involved. What is the equivalent of that inside uh, iGaming, for example? As in, like we mentioned, uh, uh, welcome bonuses or, or or offers, so to speak. But is there a, is there a price tag in inside iGaming? Is it the, is it the rake in poker? Is it the uh, you know, or is it more evolving around the welcome offers and the, and, the, and that sort of thing? Like, do you know what I mean? Maybe the, the odds of winning might be one of those things. Yeah, you can work RTP, on. Uh, yes. these kind of things. Yes, exactly. Th that's one of those things we can work on. Yeah. But then it needs to be something that is perceived as a response to our target audience needs yeah. and desires as well. Yeah. So how how do we make it clear that you have better chances to win with Betson than you yeah. would with another another brand, for yes. example? Yes. Um, and how do we communicate it so that we we are ethical mm. in the way we communicate mm -hmm. the the fact that yeah. you know by playing with Betson you're being entertained, yeah. you have good chances to win. Mm. Uh, how much can we communicate about mm. uh, you know Betson being the place yeah. to be to win as much as you can? Yes, you know yes. you need to be very careful about what it is that you're communicating yeah. and work within yeah. the regulation mm. limitations mm. and and mm. make sure that you are fully compliant. Yeah, yeah. So I think that one way to somewhat compensate for that mm -hmm. and i think we we're going to touch upon it yes it's maybe about building the brand yeah how, how do we build the brand you know so so that we don't touch too much about the value proposition mm -hmm. of the product that we have that looks very similar yeah or looks like you know what it is that any other competitor yeah, yeah. can bring to the table yeah so i think you know focusing on the brand, yeah. the experience that Betson can provide to you <laughs> is, is probably a key element that we, yeah. we, we want, we would like to focus on. Yes. Yes. No, absolutely agreed. Uh, okay. And, and then the field you work with on a daily basis or so media effectively. So what is your definition of media then? So media is a medium. <laughs> <laughs> media is a, it's a, um, a number of medium that you can use and yes. utilize to reach your 
audience. Yes. And uh, one of those things that I, I did when I, when I joined Betson was to try to find some sort of alignment as to what the definition of media is. Yeah. And uh, the first exercise I did when I was at Betson was to speak with every stakeholders, that being our managing directors in each market and mm. heads of marketing, to align as to what it is that they would expect from a head of media yeah. by really understand their understanding of what media means. Yeah, exactly. And the responses I got were very different. I can imagine. So some people would think that media is TV. Yeah. Some people would think that, you know, it's just out of home and display. Yeah. And then we have different jargon. We can speak about marketing 360. We can speak about online, offline. Mm. We could speak about omni-channel. Mm above the line, below the line. Well, guess what? Media pretty much touches all of these. Yes. That's what makes media difficult. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that's only the paid media side of things that we're touching on now, right? <laughs> exactly. And so to touch upon this, remember last, uh, last year in September? Yeah. We worked on one of these um, panels. Yes. That was speaking specifically about poem yes paid on earned media yes and i think that the common denominator that a lot of the advertising agencies have worked on mm. to consolidate all these media mm. channels yeah but also touch points is the poem framework yeah and and that's one of those things that is pretty, pretty much has been an attempt yeah for the advertising agencies to mm. make sense as to mm -hmm. what it is that mm -hmm. media means, yeah. basically. Yeah, try and, and build a, a framework around it. And and how, like, if you if you had to uh, look across uh, iGaming as an industry, uh, and uh, sort of uh, understanding and working with all three different types, paid, owned, and, and earned, so to speak. Like, uh, what score would you give us? Like, as in, how good are we at uh, at this? Or yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll stop talking. What, what would be your score? Well, no, I'm not going to say give us, <laughs> give ourselves because I'm yeah. in iGaming now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I know I've been, I've been in iGaming for two and a half years with Betson and then yeah. before that did some consulting yeah. but also worked on the Belgian National Lottery which I consider also, yeah. you know, something similar to iGaming because mm -hmm. some of the strategies that the Belgian National Lottery were, were doing was about yeah. retention of the um, lotto players yeah. with scratch games and mm. uh, uh, bingos, etc. So there were different strategies to bring, you know, youth to the, to the mix, yeah. right? Um, but to, to answer your, your question, I think that owned media is something that the industry has built a strength upon. And mm. I, when I put, when I think about owned media, I'm thinking about how do we make our websites more visible? Mm. And when I think about making websites more visible, I'm thinking about SEO. Mm. But then, you know, with SEO comes also many other websites that we will want to have visible that are related to the iGaming industry. Mm. And so if you put all those websites together to drive traffic to mm -hmm. those websites and you mm -hmm. consolidate them into one network, mm -hmm. then you end up with an affiliate network. Yeah. And so you have, you have different ways to bring traffic. Yeah. One is capitalize on the networks that exist and the visibility that those websites get yeah. to bring your, your brand up front. Yes. And then you start the affiliate marketing. Mm -hmm. And then the other one is to optimize your own website mm -hmm. as an operator or mm -hmm. uh, a, a game maker, it depends yeah. on the target audience you're going after so yeah. that you increase the visibility of, uh, of your website, yeah. your own website. Yes. Yes. And so that's where it started. Yeah. Now, coming back to the point we were discussing earlier in this conversation, yeah. given the fact that we are in a sort of sea of sameness when it comes to the products yeah. being very similar, yes. being provided by similar suppliers, yeah. then comes the importance of having different ways to differentiate yourself mm. in the market. Mm. And the way for you to differentiate yourself in the market is to communicate about your brand differently than from the others. Yeah. Trying to understand your target audience, mm. what they want, how to segment them, what their desires are, yeah. what their needs are. Yeah. And, and then you, you can add 
the different components of the yeah. poem. So yes. own started. Yeah. And then now we're starting to speak about paid. Yes. Easy said when sitting on the Betsen side or yeah. one of these leading iGaming operators because mm. we have funds and budgets yeah. to support yes. brand building at scale. Yeah. It's not always as easy for smaller brands within mm. the industry to accomplish that. Mm. But oh, exactly. the, the advantages that those small organizations might have that we don't have at Betsen mm. is that because of their size, yeah. they have a lot more flexibility. Mm. They are more agile. Mm. Yeah. for a decision to be made yeah. at the best level react quicker, yeah. and given the fact that this is a public company mm -hmm. we need to be very cautious about any decisions we make yeah. uh, to remain totally compliant yeah yeah exactly uh, and it's a it's a complex world and we I mean just speaking about all the, the different uh, frameworks and channels and uh, just on the media side on, on its own uh, c clearly, marketing in general, and, and, and especially iGaming marketing, is a very complex world. Uh, we spoke about before we started recording as well. Like uh, adding to that complexity, complexity is also, of course, the regulation of our industry that we're in, uh, both from a let's say a, a licensing uh, perspective, yeah. and then on top of that, uh, or sometimes part of the the licensing procedure, or on top of that, there is also the advertising restrictions that yes. uh, that the various jurisdictions will will in, will impose on us, right? So. Uh, and uh, yeah, and I guess the last component of that would be uh, what's happening, uh, for example, with the uh, uh, privacy laws, GDPR, uh, uh, that the third party platforms that we use yes. uh, as part of our day to day is imposing on us uh, more and more because they have pressure from a, from a regulatory or, or a perspective on them. Right? So if we put all of this into one pot, um, I asked the, the question to you, like, is it is it physically uh, possible for uh, CMOs and marketers in 2023 to be as efficient or as effective uh, as uh, as they were uh, just a year or two ago? So again, like let's say uh, an operator has a whatever one million euro budget, uh, the marketer is taking that to market in 2023 versus taking that to market in 2021. Uh, what is your what is your view in the current landscape on that? I think that um, the advertising and media industry is always looked into making sure that um, the user experience is fulfilled. Mm. There are a few organizations in the media industry that pretty much are the references that every media uh, person needs to refer to. One is the um, IAB. Mm -hmm. I think I mentioned that before. Yeah. Is the um, interactive uh, advertising bureau mm -hmm. and it's a reference that i highly recommend anyone to to read yeah. into because yeah. pretty much all the media that we buy is bought based on the standards that the iab put together mm -hmm. so the, mm -hmm. the trading of media yeah. follows the iab standards yeah. with that in mind the iab also is pushing the boundaries when it comes to the technology that needs to be used mm to achieve the objective of fulfilling the user experience to the mm -hmm. max. Mm -hmm. So for example, one of those things that the IAB had done back in 2016 was a project that they were calling Lean. I forgot what the acronym means, yeah. but the ac without even knowing the acronym, I, I like the, no the, no the name Lean. But yeah. Basically, the objective was to make sure that any ad wouldn't be perceived as intrusive mm -hmm. because we saw in the media industry a spike of ad blocking. Yeah due to the fact that the ads that were served to mm. the target audiences mm -hmm. or not sometimes no target really mm. were irrelevant yeah. and started to be very intrusive and annoying mm -hmm. and then prompted people to block those ads yeah. leveraging an extension within one of those browsers. Yeah. Now, because of that, I think that the IAB has pushed many of the ad tech companies mm to overcome this challenge, to enhance the user experience even more. Mm. Let me explain further. Mm -hmm. Coming back, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. giving you some context, yeah. looking into the technology, <clears throat> because the technology is very often an, an answer yeah. to some of these efficiencies yeah. and effectiveness challenges that yeah. CMOs might be yes. experiencing. Yeah. 
back then in 2016, a big buzzword that everyone was talking about is how viewable your ad is. Yeah. And then the IEB came up with a standardization as to what it is that an ad is deemed being viewable mm -hmm. versus not. Mm -hmm. The measurement was very lenient. Mm. Forward to 2023, mm -hmm. and you will realize now that many of these ad tech companies have made progress in trying to evaluate the experience people have with an ad mm -hmm. to a complete different level. And it brings me to the topic of attention-based mm. type of experiences. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we had a big buzzword about viewability back in 2016. Mm -hmm. And I'll refer back to really at the time I was working for Group M, which mm -hmm. is an advertising agency mm -hmm. or an advertising conglomerate that belongs to WPP. Mm -hmm. And at the time I was leading uh, all things digital related to uh, Nestle. Mm -hmm. I got my butt whipped by uh, the head of media back then at Nestle, whipped in the sense that you know, we needed to accelerate uh, the way we would buy media so yeah. that we would fulfill the viewability standards by mm -hmm. the IAB, but even do better than them. Mm -hmm. I won't go into the details, but, yeah. you know. Yeah. And so, um, actually, I think it's worth saying it. If you buy media today, mm -hmm. leveraging the IAB standard, mm -hmm. if an ad, meaning a non-rich media, so static yeah. image, yeah. is seen for one second, mm -hmm. 50% pixel rendered, mm -hmm. you pay for it. Mm -hmm. One second and 50%. One, se one mm -hmm. second, 50%. Mm -hmm. So if you have an image that is taking 50% of your screen mm -hmm. and the communication of your image is on the bottom part of it mm -hmm. and you happen to just scroll down a little piece, 50% mm -hmm. of it, mm -hmm. you might not even see the brand, yeah. the logo, yeah. nor the communication, yeah. but you will end up paying for it. Yes. <laughs> That's what's happening. Yeah. Yeah. And so... The industry, Nestle, back mm -hmm. in 2016, was mm -hmm. not okay with this. Mm. They didn't agree. They wanted to have 100% of the image Viewed. served to someone yeah, yeah, yeah. for three seconds. Yes, because before they wanted to pay for it. Otherwise, there would have not been no effect. Not, nothing exactly. would have been transferred. Yeah. So <laughs> the challenge with that is that it would increase the cost mm. of the impression. Yeah. So it would, there would be an inflation. Mm. But measurements were only starting to happen. Yeah. And I think that these FMCG companies have pushed the boundary, mm -hmm. have pushed the industry to request better experience mm -hmm. and better return on the investments, mm -hmm. not so much based on the volume of impressions and of ads being served mm -hmm. to consumers, but the quality of mm -hmm. it. And I think that this was a sort of a precursor a pioneer mm. of what it is that we are observing now yeah. with the attention-based type of measurement. Yeah. Now okay. the, the attention-based is is a is a it's a new it's a new trend. A new, a new yeah. trend. I question whether this is the new viewability <laughs> trend. <laughs> yes. There are different ways to evaluate the attention. Yeah. And I would invite the audience to look it up yeah. again. Yes. Within the IEB website to yes. see how this can be measured. Yeah. But this is. Finally, to, to, after giving you this all context, coming yeah. back to the very early question yeah. you asked about the CMOs, yeah. if you want to achieve effectiveness, you need to make sure that the ad that is served is seen, Yes, that your logo is seen, that mm -hmm. the communication that you have within mm -hmm. that experience mm -hmm. is something that people pay attention to. Yeah. So you need to get hyper granular, actually. Yeah, I mean, that's a very, very granular level uh, it, in order to make sure you get your, your money's worth, so to speak, right? Yes, but then you, you can have that granularity yeah. leveraging a technology that yeah. allows you to do this at scale because yes. that technology exists in the sense that it will allow you to make sure that every media you buy mm. will go to, through that third-party technology mm. to verify mm the accuracy mm -hmm. of the ad that's being served to a target audience. Mm -hmm. There are machines to do this. Yeah, yeah. And so, but it's very, very often, I believe it's in the nitty gritty, in the details, yeah. in the multiplier of these details that yeah. you can find ways mm -hmm. to drive better performance yeah. and increase efficiency. Yeah. It, it feels, uh, would an analogy be, it's almost like in Formula One when they come into the pit to change the tires. If you, if you can shave off... Uh, 
0.01 second of, of that, you have, a, you have a massive advantage over your competitors. And it's sort of that level we need to get to when it comes to paid media as well in order to squeeze that extra 1% or half a percent. This is a good one. I know we, need, we never prepared this one, but no. I, it's true. It's too, it really is that yeah. level that the yeah. difference can be made. Yes. But if yes. you do it really well, surrounding yeah. yourself with the right yeah. people, yeah. the right stuff, and the right technology, yeah. then you can make, make yeah. a huge, uh, yeah. huge difference. Yeah. The technology is available to everyone. Yes. Yes. So it's not as if one company or one operator, or one iGaming company cannot yeah. get it. Yeah. It's about being aware that yes. this sort of thing <laughs> exists. Yeah. And that you really need to pay attention to it. Yeah. And then obviously when you're, I mean, you work at the Betson Group. So when you multiply that with, I don't know, what is it? 25 different uh, sites or brands that you operate now in multiple jurisdictions and, and massive marketing budgets, then uh, then that's uh, half the, a percent or a quarter can of a percent. Be can be humongous. Huge. Yeah. 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 Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> Very good. Um, so we keep referring to attention as a, as a new trend. Is this really a new trend, attention? And the, or, or what is the definition of it? Like, is it, are we looking at it in a different way, attention, than maybe we did uh, five years ago? So um, we, we're looking at it at the, in a different way. Basically, yeah. the way we know it at Betson is based on a, a real case mm. that we've already um, uh discussed yeah. and released some updates upon. Um, it's based on a research that has been made by a third party provider. Mm -hmm. um, if people want to look it up, they can find out, but mm -hmm. I, I, I don't think I'm going to disclose it. No, no, no. Don't spill the, uh, the secret sauce <laughs> by all means. Uh, exactly. <laughs> um, but the, the results are, are very, uh, very convincing. Yeah. And, uh, I, I think that it sets the tone for uh, our organization to dig in a bit further mm. to really find out whether this is just a trend mm. or if it is a very much reliable way to measure the impact, yeah. the experience we provide there, we're providing to our consumers mm. is driving a very strong brand recall. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Very cool. Um, Another thing uh, we touched upon a little bit before, but, um, uh, you know, we started talking about it uh, some years ago now, actually, the loss of third party cookies, effectively, uh, or but we haven't really, we haven't really gotten to it yet. No. <laughs> they keep postponing and delaying and, uh, yes. and, and so on and so forth. But there's a lot of talk about uh, moving towards uh, zero party data, or at least uh, first party data, where it's actually uh, you encouraging the the, the users as a brand to to engage with some type of rich media or quiz or survey or game or whatever and part of that uh, you would you would give your permission so to speak to to that brand to, to have the data and then from there you you would have someone something to work with so to speak um but nonetheless uh, there's no doubt that uh, you know Google Apple uh, all, all the, the major browsers are moving in this direction and yes one day it will happen right? Uh, sort of for, for real. So what do you think that um, uh, we've had some years to think about it now, but where are we now in 2023? Like how is the specifically the iGaming industry adapting to, to that? Uh, have we become more creative? Are we, uh, have we started acting on this and actually collecting zero party or first party data? Or are we still half asleep and we need to wake up soon because the reality will hit us before we know it? What's I, your view? I cannot speak for the industry itself. <laughs> yeah. I can speak for uh, Betson mm -hmm. and also for what's been communicated around advertisers as a whole, yeah. which might include other iGaming companies. Yeah. So from a Betson's perspective, we velo we've been very much aware of this shift yeah. and we, we're working quite extensively on making sure that this is addressed. I think we, we are, we are ready. We are ready or we, we have ways to work around yeah. the problem that we, we might face in the future Yeah. from an industry. When I say industry, media industry that encompasses and you know, includes multiple advertisers. Mm -hmm. um, what I've been told is that a lot of the advertisers have already started to adapt mm. uh, the, the, the upcoming change basically. Yeah. 
And so um, the solution that many have found, well, there are two solutions. One is to find a way to leverage first party data mm -hmm. with a single sign on type of solution mm -hmm. that we sometimes do not own, but we need to look into suppliers that have that solution. Yeah. And the other one is the enhancement of the user experience mm. uh, through contextual targeting. Yeah. Yeah. So the first one is very much about, to, to explain it in a nutshell, if you want to buy media within the Google Display Network mm. or whenever, whatever network, mm. um, you need to be able to find media suppliers, mm -hmm. which are called supply-side platforms, mm -hmm. SSPs. Mm -hmm. And the SSPs are a sort of curated network of multiple publishers. Yeah that connect to their supplying platform. And so by having a sort of single sign-on explicit consent approval to be, you know, yeah. tracked, yeah. then you might come up with the possibility to retarget that audience mm. because the single sign-on you provided once you consume content on iGaming Next, for mm. example, mm will also allow you to be tracked when you consume content on another magazine, mm, for example, mm, mm. because they're part of the same supplier. Yeah, yeah. The contextual aspect mm -hmm. leads me a little bit more to, again, what it is that the advertising platforms have done. Yeah. That being making sure that your brand is placed on a page or a website mm. that is deemed safe. Yeah for your brand by mm. making sure that when an ad is placed there, the surrounding content mm. is contextually relevant to the ad we're pushing. Mm -hmm. The safety of it mm -hmm. is to make sure that you're not going to communicate something about your brand, yeah. but then the context on which the yeah. brand is being displayed yeah. speaks negatively about the industry you're yes. in. Yes. There's been cases like this yeah. in iGaming, <laughs> With BP, yeah, uh, yeah, many different brands. Yeah. So you, you need to be ready for pushing pushing their latest uh, oil product uh, on a on an article where there was a, a massive uh, oil spill uh, in, the, in the ocean, so to speak. So just yes. to give uh, an example, um, yeah, yes. And so contextual targeting is yeah. one of those things that is important. Yeah. And with that comes the very hot topic that everyone's been discussing is AI. Yes. How do we have or leverage technology so that, you know, yes. we make sure that yes. we understand the, the, yeah. the meaning yes. of the page? Yes. yes. But before we get to that, so stay, so contextual marketing has been around for a long time as well, yes. right? So, so the, you know, the loss of third party cookies actually um, gets me somewhat excited as well because I, I see opportunity in it as well. And I would hope that we as an industry also lean much more into this, like yes. the, 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 that we spend, a, you know, I think we have been in a, in a position where it has been too easy. Like, you, you know, these third party platforms, you know, who do you want to target? You know, exactly this profile in the, that has done this behavior in this location, press a button, job done kind of thing. Yes. You know, you're, you're very, very hyper targeted. Um, and um, and with that also comes, I guess, an element of laziness to some extent. It's been yes. too easy. So now with the loss of third party cookies, I, I would like to think that there's also an element of uh, creativity that gets re-injected into uh, the paid media side and uh, reconnecting with all these uh, these tools, right? And really sort of, and I, and I think it sort of forces us as marketeers to come back to thinking about who are we as a product? What is our objective? What is our target audience? And how do we actually work with the media, uh, you know, the, the outlets, you know, almost back to the physical days of, okay, this newspaper is uh, leaning this way. And, you know, is this relevant to us as a brand, you yes. know, uh, to, to exaggerate the point a bit. But, but so, uh, so yes, it's annoying to lose and, you know, how is it going to affect efficiency, et cetera, et cetera. But on the other hand, I would like to think that it gets us, it brings us sort of back to, the, the the true nature and us really thinking about who are we yes what is our brand and how do we communicate that what media type should we should we buy yes um in order to communicate and i think that's a healthy direction to to go in i think you're touching a really good point you know the the, the attention is not so much just about the creative yeah that, okay 
I opened Pandora's box. This is really good. This is really good. So there's been um for the audience, this will be a three hour podcast, by the way. <laughs> for the <laughs> audience. <going. laughs> they could look for the A B C D of YouTube. And we discussed it last yeah. uh, last year uh, when Oli uh, yes. you know was presenting or yeah. Oliver from Google was yeah. presenting this. Yeah. The A B C D touches upon three <laughs> pillars to make sure that you engage well with the communication, yeah. the brand, the creative, and the yeah. media. Yeah. The media always takes the hit because that's the one that's being measured. Mm. Like, yeah. somewhat yeah. objectively. Yes. CPM, mm. clicks, impressions, mm. blah, blah, mm. blah. Mm. You don't have such measurement with creative. Yeah. No, we, we don't know what good creative mm -hmm. is versus bad creative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then there is also the brand building. So what's being communicated within that. Mm. And then the, the, the other element is the, the contextual. Yeah. So if you put a, cre a piece of creative in an environment that is contextually irrelevant yeah. on a media platform or a channel mm. that is not fully relevant to you, yeah. You will never be able to drive the attention of this person. Yeah. You want to capture the attention when this person is actually leaning forward, yeah. consuming like in market mm. and provide them with a extension of what it is that they are currently reading. Yeah. One of the examples that we spoke about back then in the uh, media agency world is the connection between car buying and insurance. Mm. If you buy a new car, you're already also in market to reconsider the insurance you have. Mm, mm. Because if you have an older car, mm -hmm. you have an insurance that doesn't cover your car the same way as it would, would should you have a new car. Yeah. So you will be back in market also yeah. to reconsider the type of insurance deal you will need to go through. Yeah. And so if you want to purchase the latest model of a wh whatever brand, mm. contextually, it would be beneficial for an insurance company to mm. say, hmm, seems like you're interested in buying a new car. Mm. Don't forget that when you buy a new car, you mm. might want to consider us mm -hmm. when comes the time for you to purchase a new insurance. Yeah. And, and so right there, you will pay attention to it and say, oh, yes, yes, I saw AXA. I mean, I don't want to make the, yeah, yeah, the yeah. advertising for any of these yeah, companies, yeah. but AXA is the first one that comes yeah. to mind because I'm from Belgium and this yes. is one of those. Yeah. And then, but all this actually plays in to yeah. drive attention. Yeah. <gasps> yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I think it's, you know, to uh, paraphrase good old uh, Mark Ritson, uh, I think this is, uh, so... Uh, we we within iGaming, uh, uh, myself included, and the the previous uh, previous role I've been in, it's we often go around thinking that this uh, world we live in, which really and truly is uh, a lot of performance marketing, if you will, or or, or paid media, whatever you want to call it, um, that it's that that is all there is to marketing, and we live in this world, and it's all about Google Analytics and measuring and all the KPIs that you're mentioning. But we really need to get better as an industry to zoom out. Yes. Um, and, uh, and, you know, written always says, you know, step one is diagnosis. Who are you as a brand? What markets are you going into? What is, how are you orientated uh, inside the market, basically, as a company? Then once you have clarity on that, you have done your research, you've done your homework. Okay, then you define your strategy. Within that, who are, who are we? Where are we going? How you know? Where do we want to go? How are we going to achieve it? And then comes execution. And inside execution, there is a small box called performance or paid media. Yes. But in in this industry, we tend to spend ninety nine percent of our time over there. So uh, anyway, long you mean long winded answer that to the nitty gritty KPIs basically uh, without thinking about the bigger picture. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, we're way too zoomed in yes. into this world, and we we have a tendency to think that that is the box. Yes. That is called marketing but we desperately need to zoom out yes uh, in, in this industry to see the full picture and, and and appreciate also strategy and diagnosis and i don't think we spend nearly enough time doing that um, but anyway that was a long wide answer back to the point that with the with the loss of third-party cookies i think it will naturally force us a little bit out of that box and thinking back in, you know moving from execution back to strategy and hopefully back to diagnosis so saying okay what are we actually doing here 
we're, we're, we're buying media and, uh, and uh, does it actually match our brand and what our objectives and where we fit into the marketplace? I agree. So uh, anyway, that was a <laughs> long way. No, no, uh, I think, I, I think, I think to, to, to <laughs> this is relevant to that, you know, uh, to, to go back to, to add to your point. Mm. A fun part of working on the advertising agency side, though not always fair, is that while you are working fully allocated as one FT, 100% of your time, mm. and sometimes you split your time among different brands or different type of advertisers, mm -hmm. you're asked to work 40 hours a week, but very often comes the time when you're being asked to work on a pitch, meaning you know you need to come up with a proposal and really evaluate whether we could win a new client mm. because that's how the agencies grow. Mm. And so from a 40 hour week, sometimes you end up with a 60 hour week, mm -hmm. very often, yeah. if, especially if you live in New York. Then yes, that's, it's, the, that's the norm. This is 40 it. hours a week is, <laughs> is holiday. This is it. <laughs> but part time. It's a fast learning curve. It's a fast paced environment. And what's fascinating is that each time you work on these pitches, you start exactly with what it is that you're saying. Mm. We start with a strategy and then you start, you, you work with strategic planners, mm -hmm. creative people. Mm -hmm. You work in what we call, if you, you probably know this, but the, uh, the war rooms mm. and you have all these different, you know, sketches of mm. what the storyline is going to be. Okay. Mm. We're going to speak about this. What target audience are we going to target? Mm. And you have people sitting and then you have the ha ha moment that mm. say, this is where we're going to communicate. Yeah. This is where we're going to present to a new potential, um, our, our prospect, right? Yeah. The reason why I'm saying this is because it's where it all starts. Yes. Is drafting the strategy, developing and trying to understand mm. the market, mm -hmm. the competitive landscape, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what your competitors offer as an experience, mm -hmm. what it is that your competitors communicate, mm -hmm. your target audience, yeah. developing the personas, yeah. developing a journey. Mm. All there is shaped up mm -hmm. from the top mm -hmm. to feed the bottom. Yeah. And then once you have that, yeah. the beauty of the machines that we use in media mm -hmm. is that the very, the very personas that you can build up front can be somewhat forecasted at the performance level. Mm. If you go in Facebook, mm -hmm. you can pretty much segment the age, mm -hmm. the interests, mm -hmm. the behavior, the market. Mm. Many of these demographic mm. specificities yeah. can be plugged into the buying machine. Mm -hmm. So you have the strategic one, mm -hmm. you've identified the persona, mm -hmm. you plug them into the machine, you simulate and forecast what the performance can be. Yeah. And you can already start having some sort of level of accuracy mm. as to whether the sto this audience that you distinguish as the perfect one yeah. will drive the return that you would like to get. Yeah. And so yeah. it starts from the top. Yeah. Exactly. And speaking about efficiency and, and effectiveness in, in, in your media spend, I would argue that, uh, you know, it's all well and good that you look at the machine and your DSPs and you tweak and you do the Formula One uh, yes, optimization, etc., yes. etc. Et but uh, I would argue that the, the um, let's say the gold nuggets will be uh, 10 or 100 times bigger in terms of efficiency if you work on a strategic level and you understand you know, who, who your brand are, who are you trying to reach, what are we trying to portray, you know, all these kind of things in the, in the strategy piece. And then, and then once you have all of those things in place, then you can, then you can tweak yes. the, how fast it, it takes to change the tires, so to speak, uh, in, in Formula One, right? Indeed. Uh, so could it be then the definition of efficiency and effectiveness then? You know, you need to be very wise as to what your target audience is yeah, uh, at the strategic level. And then yeah. you work the efficiencies on the bottom to make sure that you, you're squeezing yeah. as yeah. much uh, the budget that you have to buy yeah. to get a better return. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, if I would say if there's one thing I, I, I would like all of us to do better is to zoom out of that performance yes. box and really spend some time on understanding the, the markets we are operating in, setting the right strategy, and then, and only then, start spending money on paid media, media and execution. Because without the, the, the previous two, you're surely introducing waste and, uh, and, uh, and impressions that, that does not move the needle uh, one, one bit at all. Could not agree more. That would be the, 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 the costliest yeah. initiative yeah. anyone could do by targeting uh, the wrong uh, audience. Exactly. I agree. Exactly. And I know that this is close to you, 
in, 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 a, in, in a testament of that is that when you started the marketing track in September, mm. the very first topic that you put on yeah. was strategy and yeah. finding the yeah. insights about the target audience. Yeah. Customer insights, yeah. market research. Yeah. Starts there. Okay, cool. Um, before we get carried away here, <laughs> let's get back on track. <laughs> um, one thing we spoke about as well was, um, so again, I guess on the, on the tale of contextual and, and relevance, et cetera, et cetera, we also spoke about sort of rich media uh, com coming, coming back in, if you will, or maybe it has never left us, but, but sort of it's definitely being amplified now and sort of like, how, how can we work with re rich media formats to, to achieve our objectives uh, more? So what, what, you know, when we speak about rich media, very much sort of about interactivity and uh, uh, not just having a static ad that you can, you can look at, but something you can, you can in, in engage with or, or, or view or whatever it might be. Um, so on the, on the, uh, the rich uh, media piece, um, What's the latest uh, and how do we, you know, what sh how should we think about this and, yes. and include it in, in, our, in our media bucket, I guess? It's a good one. Um, these rich media experiences have been explored many times. Yeah. Um, back then, the IAB had approved six interactive media, which they called then, and again, people can Google them, they called the rising stars, the mm -hmm. IAB rising stars. They mm -hmm. were interactive banners that people could play with. So for example, you would have a banner with the uh, model of the BMW and you could, you know, click within mm -hmm. the experience of the, the banner, mm -hmm. the different colors of the car model, the, the, mm -hmm. the car models that you could put in, potentially purchase. So it's mm -hmm. already, it was an aim for um, the target audience to engage with it. Yeah. The challenge with that is that a balance needs to be found mm. between the publisher that's hosting that mm. ad mm -hmm. and the advertiser, you know, pushing that ad within the publisher's website. Yeah. Because once, you know, the engagement is such that people are consuming the ad more than the content of the publisher, mm. the publisher might lose that audience. Mm. So it's always finding the right balance. One that is coming up very strongly, well, it's been there for quite a while, is uh, the gamification of some of the experiences. Mm -hmm. So again, it's, it's a different word, different buzzword. Yeah. But the gamification is most of the time something that people relate to as the rewards that you get as you play a, a game. Yeah. Most of the time on mobile devices. Mm -hmm. And so... The typical one that I can, you know, give as an example is if you want to play the game for free, the trade-off, just like outside the game environment, so mm. there, are, there are different marketplaces. The marketplace yeah. we know is broadcasting TV. And then the other marketplace we know is the publishers and media owners mm. where you consume content, right? It could be newspapers, magazines, mm. and then the big GAFAM owning 80% of the mm -hmm. well-known marketplace, mm -hmm. Google, Amazon, Facebook, mm -hmm. Microsoft, mm -hmm. Apple. Mm -hmm. And so, but to go back on to, into that experience of the, the reward videos and the, the gamification mm. rather, mm -hmm. is that one of those things you could do when you play the game for free is to consume a video. Mm -hmm. And then the video then allows you to have a budget release that allows you to accelerate within the game and move from one level to the other much faster. Mm. And you can spend your time, I've done it, you can spend your time consuming, consuming a video, a mm -hmm. short video mm -hmm. each time to collect money. And then you can buy yourself into the game without mm. spending your own money, but mm. you're consuming content yeah. from the advertisers. <laughs> yeah. The experience is such that those are videos. The experience is, to me, bad and sometimes intrusive. Mm. It needs to be more entertaining. Mm -hmm. And so the gamification is another experience that's provided to the same target audiences, mm. but really prompt the users to engage yeah. with the game. Yeah. And so that is one of these rich media types that mm. is being you know pushed more and more. Yeah. 
to try to make sure that you find the right balance with the advertising mm. that's being pushed to you mm -hmm. so that you find it entertaining enough mm -hmm. and not intrusive mm -hmm. and keep playing the game further and further. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's the example I can give you. Yeah. Some of them yeah, is yeah. Spot the Ball. Another yeah. one is, uh, I don't know, it could be a scratch game. Yeah. Any of those games that really, you know, some of our casinos have, it's just that instead of having it within a casino, mm. you can amplify that experience outside the casino and put it yeah. on a mobile device yeah. where someone's playing a game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, and um, I guess the, at least, you know, back in the days, rich media always used to have um, uh, the, the main negative being that it's... Um, because it's a rich experience, it requires a lot more involvement from the user. Uh, so I think you have to be very conscious of, you know, if you if you subscribe to the good old marketing funnel, uh, to use the tactic uh, at the right place, so to speak. And you know, I think because there's more involvement, uh, you know, the user needs to be somewhat closer to the to the conversion line, if you will. Uh, if you're trying to build just raw awareness or familiarity with your brand maybe rich media would, would, would not be the right thing to do? Or what, what's your view on this? Uh, or is, it still, is it still a good, good mix, uh, part of the mix? Well, the thing, you, I, if you are the game maker mm -hmm. or the game owner, mm -hmm. you don't want your audience to click on an experience yeah. and leave the game. Yes. You want to retain those people yes. within. Yeah. Because the, the, way, the way they monetize, I mean, the, the way media owners, yeah. and I would call those games as well now media yeah. owners, yeah. There are some suppliers that mm -hmm. specialize mm -hmm. in game mm -hmm. supply mm -hmm. and the supply that they have, they call it publishers. Yeah. So the game owners mm -hmm. are considered as publishers, yeah. but instead of publishing a banner within a newspaper, mm -hmm. they publishing a, an ad mm. or an experience within yeah. the game. Yeah. And so I lost my thought. Um, <laughs> Yes. What, what was the question again? No, I'm saying it, it's sort of. Um, so let's say uh, if you are um, if you are a game provider, so a, a non non so not a re, not a casino game, but a, a video game, so to speak, yes. or, or a social game, so to speak, free to play, um, uh, and you are um, buying uh, media inside uh, another game, so to speak. Yes. That makes a lot of sense because the person is already engaged, locked in, yes. playing another game. He's clearly. Uh, very likely to try something new, so to speak, straight away. So uh, presenting a rich media format there uh, makes a lot of sense. Or like you're saying, uh, you know, instead of paying, you can watch an ad and then yes. you can continue playing. Um, so that makes a ton of sense. But if you were trying to, uh, let's say, um, if you were, tr so I guess my point is that the rich media format sits very close to the conversion uh, uh, line yes. that the people will right now is right now in the ecosystem and is willing to try a new game. Yes. If you are trying to get uh, new people into your category or get gamers familiar with uh, with paid gaming or or real money gaming, um, uh, and you are sort of working at more the the top layer of the funnel, so to speak. Uh, is there a risk that rich media is too big of a commitment to ask for um, from the users that you know you will be? It's a more expensive format, right? You will, you will, you will spend. You will. It takes a lot of time to produce and f figure out and all these kind of things. Is it the right place in the funnel for rich media? I guess, or should you stick to the to the to the more sort of static versions of just getting your logo out there or your tagline or your or whatever it is? Uh, well, all this needs to be measured. Yeah. Again, yeah. Um, but w one of those gamification uh, experiences is, is one that is also measured by the same third party research company. Yeah we've been using to yeah. evaluate the attention-based initiative we've yes. had. Yeah. And so gamification uses the same, um, the same study, yeah. the same research yeah. process. Yeah. But where I wanted to get to, where I lost my, my <laughs> thought was that The user experience, wherever we go, yeah. I, as I mentioned there, I saw I mentioned, you know, the marketplace with mm. Google, the marketplace with the publishers, and then the marketplace within the games, yeah. it's always the same. Mm -hmm. um, is there are two ways to monetize. You either subscribe mm -hmm. or 
you don't subscribe and you have to consume ads. Yeah, exactly. That's it. And yeah. that's the revenue making machines that yeah. publishers have. Yeah. In either in these marketplaces. Yeah. That's that's what it is. Yes. And so we we actually uh, try to do this. I remember when I was at Group and to think about a world without ads. Yeah. What would it look like? Yes. Well, you would have to pay for the content that you want to consume and no yeah. one wants to pay for it. No, exactly. And then people complain that because, you know, yeah. uh, they want to consume content for free without realizing it while they're being bombarded with ads. Yeah. And then it's always finding the, <clears throat> the efficient frontier. Yeah. That's what it is that we need to look into. Yeah. Efficient frontier between paid for content that you can consume mm. against the ads mm. that you will have to consume if you don't want to pay for the content. Yeah. And um, th that's pretty much yeah. where, where the, the, the industry as a whole mm. is, is at the moment. It's yeah. just you either invest for the content yeah. and you read it yeah. on your own or not. But yeah. you, you see this, uh, this, uh, these changes happening also with the likes of Netflix. Mm. Netflix has has made the bus, you know, in the end of last year where mm. most of the content needed to be paid, mm. but then now there might be some sort of ads being provided mm. in there mm. at a high cost, by the way, yeah. uh, which then again needs to be evaluated yeah. um, and really evaluated for that efficient frontier I just mentioned. Yeah. So it's efficient frontier <clears throat> across different devices, different yeah. formats. Is it better to actually put a game within the reward yeah. than putting an ad on a newspaper mm. as before. I mm. think that the common denominator could be how much attention yeah. these ads are getting. Yeah. And that's why most likely the attention buzz that we were talking yeah. about yeah. is becoming a sort of a inspiration mm. or source mm for truth mm -hmm. that will allow to compare the different experiences in a very standardized way. Yeah, cool. So ads, that's what I think. Ads are our friends, basically, or relevant ads are our friends because uh, we don't have to pay for the content or it help, helps us pay for the content. Oh, so to speak, but I'm a victim of my work. Yes. I, yes. I hate ads. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's uh, like, it's like the, the baker, right? You never, you never eat your own bread, isn't that? No, what exactly. Yeah. So. Yeah. Sp speaking of our uh, uh, and sort of starting to round off the, the podcast slowly, slowly, but speaking about uh, another uh, best friend at the moment, uh, uh, we can't have a marketing podcast and not talk about AI or more specifically uh, chat GPT uh, that's uh, that's happening at the moment. So let's have a have a light touch on this. But uh, uh, what would you say is how good are we in iGaming today? Uh, or let's say how 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 many uh, brands out there or companies out there in iGaming do you think today is already leveraging uh, chat gpt or or uh, or generative uh, ai uh, for their uh, for their services or production lines or whatever it is I, I, like are we uh, very much uh, leaning into this and a lot of uh, companies are doing this or are we as an industry as a whole sort of on a wait and see kind of mode what what's your view um, I think that a lot of uh, iGaming companies are looking into it mm -hmm. because if you want to create content quickly, you will be tempted to turn to ChatGPT mm -hmm. for it to create content for you yeah. and leverage this content to have content uh, on your websites. Mm -hmm. Not to forget that the iGaming industry still relies quite a bit on SEO mm -hmm. and affiliate, which mm -hmm. we discussed very early yeah. on within yeah. you know this uh, this yeah. conversation. Yeah, and so maybe the the quick reflex many companies might have would be to leverage ChatGPT to create content mm -hmm. uh, because content is king, mm -hmm. and then everyone would refer to the same machine to mm -hmm. pretty much. Sorry for my word. Shit out some content that <laughs> yeah. uh, you know you 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 as a machine to create for you yeah. at scale. Yes, I think that uh, so the danger would be that everyone might have very similar content produced mm. by the same machine. Mm. Um, 
I might be wrong. It depends on the input you put yeah. within the search uh, system yeah. within ChatGPT for yeah. it to create content for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, but there are some nuances that I think that the machine will forget mm. that the other machine that we base our SEO onto will spot very quickly. Yeah. That being Google. Yeah. So I think it's going to be a battlefield between ChatGPT and Google, not only for the market share that they would want to have, yeah. but for Google to retain its business the way it is, because we need to still consider that the Google.com product, mm. that mm. being the search engine result page yeah. that everybody knows, yeah. still generates 60% of the revenue Google generates globally. That yeah. when I say Google, yeah. alphabet. Yes. Yeah? yes. So it's a massive chunk. Yeah. And so... I read somewhere that Google wouldn't be so keen, don't, I mean, I, I, mm. I can't predict the future, yeah. wouldn't be so keen to touch, you know, their revenue making machine yeah. too much. Yeah. But I think that their AI is very intelligent as well yeah. to be able to spot what maybe another AI yeah. would actually produce without the human touch, mm, you know, mm. that is necessary to make your content yeah. distinct yeah. from another one. Yeah. And so the reason why I said that it would be another battlefield there is that Google's crawling or crawlers yeah. will probably read the content of those pages and spot some sort of um, systematic ways mm. that ChatGBT would have mm. to create content based on an input mm. SEOs and affiliate marketeers would actually put. Yeah. That's my way of seeing it. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. market share. Yeah. Like what could we use this machine and how could we apply them mm. for marketing purposes? Mm. But also how could one machine that's generating a lot of money at the moment yeah. could spot whether this content yeah. is really being generated by human being yeah. and it provides yeah. user experience value yeah. versus AI. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's yeah. one of my views on yeah. it. Yeah. Um, but again, coming back to your question, how many of these iGaming companies are leveraging ChatGPT? Mm. Given the legacy of SEO mm. and affiliate, I believe that many might think into using this and mm. try to fool Google. Mm. Google has been fooled forever. Yeah. But Google has always find ways to uh. spot yes how it's been <laughs> yeah fooled. exactly um, yeah, it only lasts so long yeah yeah but uh okay so but i'm sure uh, uh chat gpt usage and what is it going to do and uh, you know are we going to lose jobs or will it create jobs and all these kind of conversations there's many others uh, touching on that and uh, but uh one thing i thought about so uh, if we take uh, chat gpt and we look at it from a as a marketing use case i think it's so fascinating to see uh that you know there's the battle between chat gpt and i think google's version is is it brad i think or bart bart yes Sorry, bart. Bart. yeah correct um uh, and without knowing all the details but sort of looking at it from the from the outside i would say there has always been this sort of um uh, feeling that uh, you know when chat gpt launched it was like yeah yeah but Google have done this, uh, you know, started doing this way earlier and it's much more powerful than ChatGPT, blah, 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 all these kind of things. Yet they launched uh, Bard much later. Yes. Um, uh, so if you sort of just, uh, so it almost feels like Google kind of missed the boat a little bit. Like, and we speak about in marketing, the first mover advantage. Yes. Uh, like, and it's, you know, what's fascinating to me is almost like ChatGPT is almost doing to Google what Google did to search when Google launched. To Yahoo. Yeah, to Yahoo. Google mm -hmm. became the verb. Like, yes. you, you don't search, you Google it. And now, I, 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 I don't know, this is my Michael's Point. predictions here mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, a generative AI will become, you don't, uh, you don't use AI, you, you, uh, you chat GPT it or you use chat GPT. Everyone will start with chat GPT now because yes. of that first mover advantage. And, oh yeah, there is also Bart. At least yes. that's the current state in 2023. Indeed. So it feels like they almost missed the, missed the boat a little bit here. W w what do you think? Wow. Uh, I never thought of it this no. way. <laughs> uh, but it is true that, um, you know, the, the, the Google AI was based on the recognition of the legitimacy of your website. Okay, the way I'm, I'm, I'm going to say that. At first, SEO started with keyword stuffing. Mm. 
um, keyword tag mm -hmm. really was really a lot of keywords were put on, within the HTML section of the mm -hmm. of your page mm -hmm. to again you know full Bing and Yahoo yeah. at the time Microsoft and Yahoo uh, so that you you would be ranking well in Bing yeah again sorry yeah. Microsoft and <laughs> yeah. Yahoo yeah um, but then Google came back with its uh, the links yeah so that the links would be a vote mm -hmm. of credibility mm -hmm. towards the website that needs to be listed yeah. should the query correspond to the content of that yeah. page. Yeah. Um, looking at what I think, well, the, the, the reality is that, yes, Google has lost 100 million or, or I think billion, I think. I think it was 100 billion, 100 million. No idea. 100 billion, <laughs> 100 million. It might be 100 billion, yeah. really. Uh, in shares in a very short uh, short period of time, I think mm -hmm. they lost ten percent of the, the their value yeah. when you know uh, OpenAI and ChatGPT came up. Okay. Um, it recovered a little bit. Yeah. But Google being this big, and we spoke about this, you know, mm -hmm. Betson being a big organization competing against the smallest ones. Yeah. You don't always have, even though the people who are leading the organization can mm -hmm. see clearly. Yeah. What it what needs to be done? Yeah. You you are so big that you need to go through different layers to yeah. really, you know, make sure that you you taking all the precautions necessary to be compliant. Yeah. And I think that one of the weaknesses of Google is its size, mm. and also the fact that um, they need to be as ethical mm. as possible because yeah. they're being watched. Yes. They're being watched as a reference. Yeah. Yeah. And so had they decided to launch BARD mm. earlier, mm. people might would have questioned why they would do this because they already know so much about us. Mm. Yeah. G yeah, GDPR yeah. is one of those things that is was aimed to stop yeah, Google yeah. from knowing too much about us and protect our privacy. Yeah. Right. So there, there, there are institutions actually in the world uh, that are focusing on how much technology mm. can be leveraged, mm. but what are the limitations that we need to impose on technology yeah. to make sure that the technology that is available. Yeah is not pushed too quickly before it goes through layers yeah. of approval yeah. so that it is ethically acceptable. Yes. yes. <laughs> and so mm. what we see in ChatGPT is that it's been launched, mm. but schools were not prepared for that. Mm -hmm. And so people are cheating, yeah. you know, <laughs> getting their content out. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, there is a, yeah. a, a barrier that I believe Google was scared to pass yeah because they could have fallen into yeah, that maybe. and be the feeder of those yeah, cheaters yeah. there are many elements in yeah, there yeah 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 maybe you know? back maybe back then google was the the small startup uh, fast and agile that came in uh, you know david versus yes. goliath kind of thing now google has become goliath and uh, and and chat gpc is is coming in as the as the challenger to that but uh, and again i don't know any details uh, about it I, I i can i'm sure i can do a lot of reading up on on uh, what's behind it and maybe there's a good reason for everything i'm just taking a step back looking at this generative ai as a normal mr and mrs jones consumer there is definitely no doubt that it's ChatGPT that's winning the 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 the, the attention uh, of the consumers today, um, and I would I would like to think that maybe inside the Chat G Chat GPT is such a tongue twister uh, that there is actually a very strong link between marketing and product as well, and maybe they actually made a conscious choice, yes. saying we know that we have Google and most likely a hundred other companies uh, trying to be first and building all these big things. But would it be good for us? Would it be better for us to say, okay, we do have a smaller model. We do only have data up to whatever April 2021 or whatever the, the limit is. But then launch, let's launch it anyway uh, as a V1 and get this first mover advantage because that will be um, so significant in this yes. area that it will be worth, I don't know, uh, tens of billions worth of marketing efforts that that Google now has to catch up with yes. in order to to get the same level of attention. Anyway, I don't know. I uh, it's just a. I would just like. I, I just have this rosy picture of the ChatGPT 
product uh, and marketing team sitting together in the same room and say, how are we going to attack this? How are we going to launch it? And there's this sort of tag teaming happening yes. that we very often in iGaming uh, see lacking and we're sitting in different silos and product doesn't necessarily speak to marketing and so on and so forth. Anyway, it's True. a big story about well, it. I, I think I just, uh, that's I think my observation at least. No, it's a good one. I, and mm. I think that another one is that if you, if you go on Wikipedia and look at Google, mm. One thing that is very interesting that I had done for quite some time, mm -hmm. I missed the um, open AI, mm -hmm. is the number of acquisitions Google has made, mm -hmm. the number of startup companies Google has acquired. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the mistakes might have been also not so much just a marketing mistake, but a business mistake mm -hmm. in a sense that maybe they were overly confident about their AI solution mm. and didn't see open AI come. Mm -hmm. And now here we come. Microsoft is back in the game by yeah. just acquiring, you yeah. know, open AI or actually yes. investing into the solution. Yeah. I think that th this is, this is one. Yeah. Um, the other one is that there are some solutions that already exist that ChatGPT could fulfill. Mm. I'm thinking about, uh, IBM. Yeah. And it's chatbot, yeah. IBM Watson being yeah. one of those, uh, you know, pioneer yeah. AI solutions that had been, you know, it's been in the market for quite some time. Yeah. So chatbot solutions could be something that ChatGPT could fulfill. Yeah. It depends on what the uh, cost will be. Should the solution be completely uh, reliable? Mm -hmm. So there, there are some applications that ChatGPT could actually fulfill within the marketing yeah. industry. Yeah. Here we're talking about chatbot, that's like customer service. Yeah, yeah. I think that we could argue that customer service could be or could not be part of marketing, but mm. customer satisfaction oh, definitely. and retention, <laughs> putting retention within, within the marketing umbrella yeah. Yeah. is something that is key. So maybe yeah. ChatGPT has its value there as yeah. well. Yeah, absolutely. I uh, know we're going down a rabbit hole and completely yes. off tangent here, but but it's an open this, this you is mentioned, an open topic, you yeah, know. But you mentioned Microsoft, and I actually think that's that's probably another uh, fantastic use case for for marketing. Uh, so uh, so that Microsoft, I, I, I guess, um, I don't know. Depend. So my view on marketing is they they were. Microsoft is to some extent they're becoming a little bit of a dinosaur. Yes, they have uh, Excel and PowerPoint, and they have uh, you yes. know Teams and all these kind of things. But uh, it, it's I, I perceive it a little bit as a dinosaur, to to be honest with you, in so this day and age. But how um, through their M and A activity and how their foresight into being part of Open AI, Open AI and and investing early and now investing heavier that literally overnight microsoft has is back on trend now yes. again and is suddenly shaking off the dinosaur uh, sort of image that they have and now they're suddenly the cool and trendy kid in the classroom uh, and they have a massive uh, advantage that uh, the second they enable uh, open ai into their legacy tools as powerpoint excel and whatever um, that they, you know, they're suddenly uh, <laughs> the leader of the pack again. Indeed. Uh, so uh, again, uh, and it's, it's such a dry topic, really, uh, you know, AI and M&A activity. But the foresight, this was whatever, five, six years ago, like they, they made this investment, right? Yes. And how it's paying dividends uh, now, six years later. So, yeah, anyway, I just noticed the uh, Google versus ChatGPT first mover and Microsoft completely changing their image overnight by by uh, an m a activity and investing into open i think it's two fantastic use cases in in how you can navigate the world of marketing i i think that uh you're totally right i think it's always shifting but it's always among these big five right, right? yeah the battlefield is really happening yeah. among these five yes so the one thing that i think that um google uh, not google microsoft uh, are doing as well is that they have their eyes on uh, on gaming mm-hmm uh, there's there's been a lot of conversation yeah. about acquiring uh Blizzard, one, right yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 and so i'm watching it very closely mm. because well this is a very big gaming provider yeah and we know that gamers are gamblers mm. <laughs> there's definitely a... and, and so i i'm i'm, I'm just think, is thinking about this they also yeah. have made an acquisition of a DSP SSP called Zendar. Mm -hmm. Zendar is the sole and unique and exclusive um, 
technology that allows to buy media within Netflix mm -hmm. for the pre-roll and mid-roll. Okay. So they're there. Yeah. I think that one of the big losses that uh, Microsoft has made is its operating system on phones. Mm. It doesn't have much of an influence on you know phones anymore. Yeah. And so yeah. if you look into one of the applications of ChatGPT, mm. it's that, yes, you can type, on your desktop, or mm -hmm. you can search on the desktop, mm -hmm. but you could just ask a question to ChatGPT to mm -hmm. give you an answer. Yeah. Well, Microsoft does not have much of a way to actually capitalize on no. any operating system on the phone yeah. to enrich their AI because yeah. they don't have yeah. that yes. phone access anymore. Yeah, yeah, they don't have. So the... that's. I think that this is a disadvantage that yeah. you know Google doesn't have yes. or Apple doesn't yes. have. Yes, correct, correct. Yeah. That's a very good point. Okay, uh, I think we have uh, Gianluca sleeping on the on the desk here, at the back here, because we've been talking for so <laughs> long. <laughs> this must officially be the longest podcast uh, I have recorded. Surely, uh, I give you next, but what a tremendous uh, conversation! Uh, so, um, uh, Ulrich, anything more you want to add on the, around the sort of the media effectiveness and the, and the the marketing side of it? I think we could go on and on and on. It it was a great pleasure having this conversation with you and to be invited in this fantastic studio. Um, but I'm sure that once the, this uh, this uh, this conversation is off, we'll we'll have plenty of time to uh, <laughs> to discuss even further. So exactly. great honor to be here. Great pleasure to have an opportunity to ping pong this yes. conversation about all things marketing and media related yeah. and uh thank you again for, for no th thank you for for coming uh Ulrich. you're such yeah. a you're such an expert in in your field and it, likewise the pleasure is uh, is mine as well and uh, i guess for the audience listening at home uh, if they want uh, more of this good stuff uh, there is uh, i give me next valetta coming up in june uh where we will definitely have uh, a marketing track where we will also talk about uh, about media and uh, and a lot more marketing stuff so watch this space before we finish off Ulrich. Uh, we started off talking about the DJ stuff and music, and we might drop some hints. We actually did not drop any hints at all during the conversation, I think. But let's finish off on that note. That's a good one. So um, let's see, Ulrich. Uh, uh, All-time favorite track from you. Um, do I have to keep it to one? Yes, okay. you have to choose one. The one that uh, <clears throat> when I just said that sentence, it was the first thing that popped into your head. Okay, it's an old one. It's a techno one. Yeah. It's made by Vapor Space. Okay. <laughs> and uh, I forgot the title of it. Vapor Space. See, we used to buy records. It yeah. was a black record made by FFM Record, but I forgot the name of it. Um, gravitational Arc. Oh, there we go. This is it. Very Vapor good. Space, gravita gravita Gravitational Arc Fantastic. is uh, probably an all time techno record. It starts very slow, builds up. Great introduction. It was a good one. Yeah. Nice, nice. And I'll have to look that one up. My one track, you know, and it's uh, again, I'm like you. I have, uh, I listen to everything, all sorts of genres, and uh, and I, I just love music in general. Um, I think the track for me, I know exactly which one it is, uh, but for me, it's more like the the moment in time and sort of the the period of time. Where it was a uh, when I think back at it, uh, it was such a fun, it still is a fantastic track, and it brings so many good memories to me. So that's why I chosen it. Um, Robin S, show me love. Oh, very nice. Uh, yes. Classic, classic house yes. track, uh, and it's you know there's a lot of uh, 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 probably better tracks out there, but it, it's just, uh, it just, uh, it, it has so many uh, memories associated uh, to it yes. with me. So for me, that's uh, definitely number one for me. So uh, I, I can relate to this. Yeah, exactly. Yes, very nice. Yes. <laughs> so I'm going to go home and listen to that one now. This I think. Good, but, uh, yes. Well, Rick, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And uh, hope to see you soon again. Absolutely. Looking forward to the next one. Yeah, let's thank do you. it. Thank <laughs> you. Thanks. Thanks.